Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and we're about to get started. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report, Susan Barrett. Great, thank you very much. I have a couple of announcements regarding public comment. So first, uh, after and starting today, uh, per today's discussion on the FY22, hospital budget guidance, uh, we will be opening a public comment period um, to comment on that guidance. We're, we're encouraging folks to comment as soon as possible. Um, there could be uh, votes on parts of the guidance uh, as early as next week, um, but we know we need to have the guidance out to the hospitals by the end of this month. And when we have a date certain, we if we have a date certain on a, a vote, we will update the guidance. Um, Chair Mullen or Patrick, do you have anything to add on that? I would just say that um, if we don't uh, conclude the guidance at next week's meeting, that the public uh, comment period will be extended. So um, until the, the guidance has been finalized, the public comment period will be open, but we will start to take votes next week, hopefully. <laughs> Great. And I know um, Patrick will probably talk more about that during his presentation. Um, and then a second ongoing public comment period that we have asked our advisory, the Green Mountain Care Board Advisory Group, as well as the Primary Care Advisory Group, to provide written comments on a, a potential subsequent all-peer model agreement with uh, the federal government and that information is located on our public comment section. We um, also encourage members of the public to share your comments so that we can share that information with the signatories on the model, that being Agency of Human Services uh, as well as the governor's office. So that is all I have to report out. I can turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Susan, were you going to make the announcement about the uh, uh, rate uh, approval, or is Mike? I believe Mike will do that. I wasn't, I, I, I didn't have that information, but I, I think he could do that as well. Uh, Mike Barber? Yeah, thank you. Um, on, so the announcement is that on Monday, March 8th, 2021, the board approved Cigna Health and Life Insurance Company's 2020 large group premium credit rate filing. The docket number is GMCB 00920RR. Uh, and the board's decision allows Cigna to provide a premium credit to its guaranteed cost large group policyholders with effective dates from May 2019 to April 2020. Uh, the credit will be equal to 10% of each eligible policyholder's average 2020 risk-adjusted monthly premium and will be applied to the April 2020 billed premium. And that is the announcement. Thank you. So just nobody is, uh, gets too overexcited and expecting uh, a significant uh, credit. Uh, the outshoot of that is it's... Um, really only one month's 10% credit. So it's um, really about 0 0.0883. Um, so uh, just don't want people to have expectations that uh, they're gonna have a, a huge credit that doesn't uh, come to bear. So um, with that, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, March 3rd. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, March 3rd, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the minutes were approved unanimously. So as we discussed at last week's meeting, um, this, this meeting, Next, next week's meeting, and possibly the, the week after that's meeting, is dedicated solely to a discussion of the 2022 hospital budget guidance. And um, as we all know, um, we are in very uncertain times. Hopefully, we're coming to an end of those uncertain times, but even that is not certain. 
And um, what we do in the budget guidance um, may be the right decision whenever we have that vote um, sometime in March, but it may still have to uh, um, be taken a look at again as we move forward and get closer to budget hearings if circumstances completely change. But we will proceed with making the best decisions possible in an uncertain world. Um, we want uh, all our hospitals to be sustainable moving forward, but we have the obligation under statute to Vermonters to um, do the due diligence, do the crunching, and um, move forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, board members and members of the public. We are here today, as the chair just discussed, to, dis to kick off the fiscal year 2022 hospital budget guidance. <clears throat> so with that, will you please let me know when you can see my screen? We can see it. Super. All right, let's go. <clears throat> so this is the roadmap for the next few weeks, potentially. Um, just a brief outline of uh, the potential um, meetings and content moving forward. And today, beginning on March 10th, we'll provide an overview here in the slide deck about some of the items in the guidance. Uh, most importantly, items that have been altered from last year. And in that, we'll review the appendices and the draft budget guidance with those alterations. And with feedback from this week, we will make any appropriate changes um, that are uh, to be considered by the board and move forward into next week's meeting on the 17th. And as the chair and executive director, director Barrett discussed for a potential vote, and if we still have some refinement to do, then we'll find ourselves meeting again on the 24th. As of right now, the, these are the three placeholders for meetings on the FY22 hospital budget guidance. <clears throat> so to provide a brief overview, um, some of the priorities this year uh, coming out of the impact of COVID, lessons learned from last year, the hospital budget debrief that we had in late November, and early December were, um, the priorities were hospital financial health, uh, continued work to align some of our regulatory processes where possible, um, uh, really fortify some of those points in last year's process that may have been a little weak on the details because we really were thinking on our toes. If you go back to March of last year, uh, we ended up having to suspend our process with um, the onset of COVID, and we didn't get back to approving a budget guidance until late May or early June. So we really had to assess the situation that the hospitals were under and what was possible at that time. And once we got to the budget process, opportunities arose throughout that that we felt that we could build into this process without creating too much undue burden on the hospitals themselves. And finally, um, creating reasonable schedules and, and turnaround times. There were some um, changes last year to the timing based on the suspension of the guidance process and whatnot. Um, so turning those back around to more historical timeframes um, and expectations has been a priority throughout this process. Uh, as part of the process, we had limited involvement with hospital CFOs, VAS, and the healthcare advocate, um, primarily because we were responding to communication from VAS back in, I believe it was December, to really give the hospitals a bit of arm's length so that they could do what they had to do to care for the people of Vermont as COVID underwent a resurgence. So we we really capitalized on that opportunity to work with Mike Del Treco of Boz and refining some of the items we're going to talk about today. And given any feedback uh, in the intermeeting period, we hope that communication and work with Boz can continue if there's areas for refinement even after today's discussion. Uh, we don't think that should stop because we're at this point in time. So if there's something there that we can continue to work on or clarify, then we're happy to do so. <clears throat> um, we also internally collaborated with our legal team to outline this guidance and sought ACO team feedback to continue to uh, regulatorily align with um, some of the ACO information that we need to tie those two processes together. And finally, we find ourselves here, the public process, where we engage in a lively discussion across <clears throat> the various board members and based on what the staff is providing you 
And so that offers the public opportunity to comment, as we discussed earlier, either in these meetings or in written form uh, to our web page. So moving forward from process, the outcome is to get a final budget guidance, um, continuing to align the hospital narratives with the presentation for ease of navigation and also updating some of these appendices to support that narrative and presentation. And you'll see throughout that we really take a financial centric focus um, this year because that is the, what that is what's important as the landscape continues to shift on us um, with, with respect to COVID. So we really want to make sure that we're getting ahead with some of those potential details so that there's less questions um, at budget time. That's kind of been the hope for this process is that we get the board members what they need in advance. Um, we have lessons learned from last year in that process that we've built upon for this FY22 process. Next up on slide four, some of our staff recommendations. Um, we start off with the obvious caveat that the board understands the challenges um, created by COVID-19 and how that can impact budgeting. And they've asked us to develop a thoughtful, some thoughtful and collaborative uh, recommendations. So one of those would be continued streamlined hospital budget submissions. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about what that looks like. It is slightly different from last year. Um, returning the submission date to July 1st, as long as we deliver guidance by the statutory date of March 31st. Um, and part of the abbreviated uh, streamlined process was last year having to think on our toes we created an alternative Excel spreadsheet for the hospitals to populate. Ultimately, they ended up having to go into adaptive anyway to submit their submitted budgets in November and then their approved budget. So we actually unintentionally created another step. And as part of correcting that this year, we are asking that they fill out these worksheets in adaptive, and we'll talk more about that, but that would be the income statement, balance sheet, payer revenue or payer mix, utilization, staff and capital expenditures. We're not asking them to go into um, service areas or departments to enter this information. That would be um, far in excess of detail that is going to actually be helpful given the situation that continues to evolve as it relates to COVID and their finances. So it would be those documents at the level that they're at and that's it. That's one of our recommendations. And to help refine that data <clears throat> that's going into adaptive and help tell their story, we've um, also built in a variance analysis financial workbook to support those narratives and presentations. So we're returning the bridges table or reconciliation tables, budget to budget and um, projection to budget. We noticed a few hospitals use this format or a their own version of it last year in their presentation. So it seemed like it was something that the hospitals were comfortable with in telling their story. So we wanted to bring that back. The charge increase in MPR detail that we've worked on um, for several weeks with VAS to recalibrate that look. Utilization estimates from a dollar's perspective and how that's going to impact their budgets. Inflation components, this is something that continues to uh, percolate year in and year out <clears throat> and understanding the influence of inflation on the operating expenses. And then there's some COVID related items that are of necessity if we're really going to um, tell the story of the hospitals. And one is carving out the revenues and expenses of vaccine clinics and the testing that they're doing and the inoculations that they're doing and understanding what that means from a revenues and expenses perspective. <clears throat> um, furthermore, we have the value-based participation. We've had some changes and fluctuations in um, value-based care this year. We're looking to broaden that look and understand um, how the attributed lives may have changed. The Vermont State Employees Union is now signed on for the coming year. And also Rutland has joined the Medicare program. So we'd like to see how those attributed lives are um, contributing to the move to value-based payment. And finally, COVID-19 funding. Last year, again, thinking on our toes, we asked the hospitals to fill out a revenue replacement form that touched on the advances from uh, government and commercial payers and also CARES Act and other um, relief funding. Well, we've refined that a little bit this year to understand what's been used and what's still sitting on the balance sheet so that we can get a better picture of um, <clears throat> what that relief funding has done for those hospitals. And finally, keeping with the uh, 
financial picture this year is we're recommending to eliminate the non-financial reporting requirement. We took a look at that and got some feedback <clears throat> from folks in our organization, and we came across a few conclusions that some of the data doesn't um, shift enough year to year. So let's take a look at how often we collect that in the future. Some of the data is going to be very skewed by COVID's impact, and some of it will be actually late in arriving. So it, it makes that work product a little difficult to digest this time around. Um, but just to reinforce that there are parts of this we are collecting. One of them is around wait times, and we'll talk about that and getting a, uh, so a little more detailed feedback on that instead of collecting simply a numbers table. Really what we're getting at is how has COVID affected your wait times? How have you had to mitigate the impact of that? And, and what types of mitigations efforts have you undertaken as far as logistics or the rise of telehealth and telemedicine? Um, but we're also asking for the community health needs assessment, which is traditionally collected in the non-financial reporting, but we'll be pairing that with the request for the 990 on September 30th. So that's a high level of our recommendations, and we'll do a little more deep dive into some of those items as we go through this presentation. <clears throat> and that leads us to our next slide where we will walk through the guidance and accompanying appendices, and then we'll touch on um, hospital budget guidance policies. The real one that we're going to touch on here will be legal has put together a standing enforcement policy, and we'll bring that up um, once we get through the guidance and appendices, and we'll have legal speak on that a little bit um, as to why they, they feel this is the, um, the next step in the enforcement policy. And then some points for discussion for your consideration that you're going to hear today is once again, the due date returning July 1st. Um, the board needs to consider what the NPR FPP gross ceiling will be. Uh, we'd like your feedback on the charge request table that we've recalibrated with assistance from VAS, the inflation table that is making its way into this process, and then the COVID, COVID vaccine clinics and um, recalibrating the COVID advances, relief funds, and other grants table that we've put into the appendices. So with that said, I'm going to navigate over to the appendices. <clears throat> And we'll begin to walk you through those items. OK, let me know when you can see my screen. We can. All right, very good. So this is just an outlay of what exists within this sheet here. Might be hard for people to read it, but. So, so, all right, great. <clears throat> so again, we're returning um, the bridges tables back into the equation to show the reconciliation between their FY21 budget and their FY22 proposed budget. And the same thing for revenues and expenses in both of those budget to budget looks. And then the same thing for um, projection to budget looks for revenues and expenses. We've added a component this year <clears throat> that will factor in from another tab the impact of the vaccine clinics and testing and what that total change would look like without or with, with sorry, without those vaccine clinics revenues and expenses. So that is something that's slightly new to this, but this should look pretty familiar to most of the hospitals who have filled this out, with the exception of last year, in years past, um, we're collecting a lot of information on the next tab as well. That should help better inform um, the perspective of how the rate impacts <coughs> the request for this year. Um, but as you can see, we also have the bridges for operating expenses. This is nothing new. And again, how did those down here in line 54, what's the impact of those COVID-19 vaccine clinics and testing on those operating expenses? And what does the reconciliation or bridges look like without that? Just to give a better perspective to the board of how much of an impact um, those clinics have had on the um, revenues and expenses budget to budget. And then we have a relative look below that of projection to budget. 
and bridging that difference as well. And again, this is to eliminate <clears throat> um, budgeting that may not be realistic to some sense. So bringing out those finer points about what's actually driving the increase or reduction in NPR and operating expenses for each hospital. The next tab is the charge and NPR detail. So we, the board had asked us in the hospital de budget debrief to revisit the <clears throat> uh, charge component of what the Green Mountain Care Board reviews every year. And we met with board member Holmes and board member Lunge and Mike Del Treco from Boz. And so the team and Mike set out to provide a different perspective on charge from the past. And it really begins with <clears throat> the charge increase. What are the or increase in this example of what are you looking to increase your charge master by? And what does that mean in dollars? And what does it mean as a total percentage? So what is your charge increase that you're bringing before the board here on line 16 as a, as a percentage point? And then the hospitals will go and they'll factor in their utilization assumptions and acuity and to some extent payer mix. And that charge factored with those items will begin to trickle into gross revenues by payer, and over here we have these broad areas of service. So we'll see the year to year budget to budget change, and then we'll see how it trickles down into these various payer categories from a gross revenue level. And this should tie to their income statement for these two years, this end result here. <clears throat> and from there, they're gonna factor in their deductions from revenue. And that's going to trickle down into NPR. So we're trying to show this, this chain from request and then gross revenue, net revenue. And we round it out because FPP, to some extent, is not related to charge, but it will round out the income statement, seeing how um, revenues are moving through that component as well. And we're not saying this is going to be perfect this year, but we're hoping this repositions us in a way in the future where we can gather better information on how this component relates to the income statement and the overall request that comes before the board. And there's probably room in the future to continue to work on this product, but we think that it offers the board more detail than they've ever had before as to how these requests are impacted on a payer and area of service level. And we hope you will consider that for adoption this year in the hospital budget process. <clears throat> Next, this is an item that was left over from the pre-COVID world after we had meetings with CFOs to understand better how um, utilization is impacting gross revenues. So this is kind of a quick breakout of that impact as well. We wanted to show that because utilization and rate are two of the main drivers of what creates the financial, um, the revenue side of these budgets. <clears throat> and it is of equal importance um, to that of rate. And those two working together are how we get to where we get when we're looking at NPR. Moving along on tab number four here, we have inflation. Now we're looking for the price effect here. And we've outlined some very specific areas that we would like the hospitals to weigh in on. And then we've got a few areas underneath that where if there are um, substantial inflationary impacts, please highlight those for us over here in lines 13, 14, and 15 specifically. But we'll be looking for the increase over prior year in percentage in dollars. And then what percentage of your operating expenses that category relate to. So you can see we have an example here around wages and compensation medical staff, and we've just given a very broad example, but we wanna understand how that impacts on your budget. Inflation continues to be a topic that's mentioned in several narratives and several presentations. And we were going to try to um, introduce this last year, but given the need to roll back some of the um, <clears throat> items we were requesting, we scrapped this um, to streamline the guidance last year, but it continues to be a factor. 
and we feel that this would really help inform the board and understand the um, inflation aspects of things like wages, drugs, and supplies, which are some of the big three when people refer to medical inflation. So we really want to highlight that factor this year as well, because it, it's that's not going to slow down in any sense, <clears throat> um, pandemic or no pandemic. Next, we're looking for a breakout of the vaccine clinics, as I discussed earlier. The hospitals are going to submit their entire budget into adaptive for record keeping purposes, but we want to be able to show the board what the breakout looks like here as far as NPR allowances go. We don't want to see the staff anyway, don't want to see hospitals um, be criticized for operating expense growth or maybe even revenue growth that's related to standing up this public good. So we wanted to highlight this and break it out for the board to see and, and understand. And when we go to do the staff analysis, we'll present to you their budget with and their budget without vaccine clinic dollars in it. So you can see the comparison to each and, and really see the impact. And we really don't know now if it'll be material or immaterial. Um, the supply chain appears to be keeping up with the demand. So that's a positive thing. <clears throat> but we also want to make sure that hospitals aren't, um, if, they're, if they're losing their shirt on these vaccine clinics, that that, that is acknowledged in this budget process. Or if, or if things turn out too well for them, we want to make sure that's involved in this hospital budget process. Again, as I stated, um, value-based care participation, we've had some uh, pretty substantive changes this year especially around who's involved in one care, <clears throat> but we're also really looking at value-based care all around, not just with one care. If there are um, value-based programs that hospitals might be involved in, we'd like to hear about that too. Um, it doesn't necessarily just have to be one care centric, and that's a bit of a change from the past, but um, value-based care is where the state is looking to head, so we want to continue to gather some of that information. And finally, on the appendices, as I stated before, last year we built a revenue replacement table, not really understanding what the future would hold for the treatment of those revenues or how much the hospitals would need. It was really a wide open landscape at the time we issued guidance back in May around what federal funding, state funding, et cetera, would look like. And we have some lessons learned from last year to refine that view. We now know that the guidance on that is changing. We now know that some hospitals are reserving these funds on their balance sheets and liabilities, such as deferred revenue. And we want to understand what's been recognized and what continues to sit in those liability accounts. And we built this based on um, some of the items that the hospitals reported to us from their FY 2020 year-end narratives. So some of this may look familiar to a few of these hospitals. <clears throat> and again, if the folks at Vaz or whatever seeing this for the first time have input, we'd like to hear it because we want to make sure what we are bringing to our board is the best information possible and um, that we're not leaving anything out. So the best way to go about that would be to hear from Vaz and their constituents at the hospitals, making sure we've captured everything here appropriately. <clears throat> that is basically the snapshot of the appendices. And as you can see, it's just building on financial details that pertain to the budgets anyway, and hope, hopefully um, contributing to the presentation and narrative component of our community hospitals. And we'll go through the guidance next year, and we will outline <clears throat> where those items fall for your consideration. Okay. So here we are on page three of the guidance. I will let everyone know this timeline is subject to change. We are still working on budget hearing dates as of this time. So this is an estimated time frame in which that will occur, but please keep in mind that it's not final yet. 
and we do have a tentative date here on July 28th to provide a preliminary budget overview at a public board meeting to the Green Mountain Care Board members. That is something that time did not allow for last year, so we're also returning that to the time frame as well. Um, but you will note we are shooting for March 31st to deliver guidance with information and input and questions from the healthcare advocate, and then requesting submission of these budgets by July 1st of 2021. And then we'll move through our review and analysis and um, make sure that these documents tick and tie with the other documents they're going to submit around errors and presentations. We want to eliminate as many um, oversights or errors as possible before we get into hospital budget presentations and also put together any final questions on items that we may think would stand out to the board um, to round out that discussion. <clears throat> Fast forwarding past the budget hearings, which you've already mentioned here, um, September 1st through 15th would be deliberations and votes at public board meetings with final decisions issued by September 15th per the statute. And then on September 30th, <clears throat> we're requesting the most recent 990 IRS tax form and updated um, community health needs assessment and or progress report. And we'll most likely be reaching out to hospitals to whom that would apply. Uh, we've got to get caught up on where folks stand after not collecting it last year. Normally we track that, but we're going to have to go back um, in transparency and, and make sure we're collecting from the right folks. <clears throat> and then finally, October 1st, we will submit budget orders and send them to the hospitals after working with our legal team. So Mr. Chair, I plan to just go through this and highlight the areas of change. Is that okay? That is fine. Okay, good. All right, so we do start off on page five, um, making folks aware that we understand this environment is exceptionally difficult and it's going to take some time to recover from the impact, of, um, the financial impact of COVID. This is left over from last year and it's still pertinent now from the staff's perspective. Um, we are still in this pandemic as we've discussed on this meeting already. Um, but one thing that we wanted to point out here is um, this sentence here that GMC policies related to budget amendments, adjustments, and exemptions from public hearing and hospital enforcement can be found in Part D of the appendices. And historically, some of this stuff has actually been within this document, but because they don't change very often, we're pulling them out and putting them in the appendices to really put this document on the platform that this is what the Green Mountain Care Board expects. So those um, policies related to those items are more support for this guidance document. So in terms of efficiency, we've moved that out. Um, <clears throat> that's not a major change. Um, next, we have NPR and fixed perspective payment growth ceiling. Uh, the board will have to decide on what that will be this year in 2022. And then we have <clears throat> Um, this piece here, this will be trickled in throughout through the presentation and narrative sections that the board's permitting an allowance for NPR and FPP revenues and expenses related to the COVID vaccine clinics. So it's very upfront that this is something we would expect to see um, brought out by the hospitals. And I'll cite you back to the appendices on that note for where we intend to collect that information. Again, another technical component here is traditionally we've had in section two <clears throat> instructions around adaptive, and that didn't really see like, seem like it fit in a guidance document that's providing budget guidance to um, the hospitals. So again, we've pulled that out. That is a supporting element to 
this document. So we've moved that out to keep the flow moving around what the board expects and how they expect it. And then the adaptive submission is its own separate piece. So we brought that out and down to the bottom. We've made no changes to it, aside from what I mentioned earlier around the high level um, request for income statements, balance sheet, payer mix, et cetera. <clears throat> Moving into part B here, year over year changes. Again, we've highlighted in more specificity for the hospitals um, to discuss the vaccine clinics and the breakout and <clears throat> the effect that it's had on your projection and your budget for 2022. For those who, are, who know the RFP that they had to fill out for the state, the initial period I believe is 12 months, and there's the option to renew for two six month periods after that. So total duration could be 24 months. I hope that hasn't changed or I'm misstating that. Um, but we could be looking at vaccine clinics running into uh, well into the future should the hospital feel the need to continue to stand those up to um, inoculate their communities. <clears throat> I missed it. There it is. So moving into the charge request piece, a little more detail around that is want them to reference the data submitted in Appendix 2 and explain your overall charge request and then explain the impact on gross revenues, MPR, and how, it, how it trickles down through um, those components by payer. And what those and what assumptions were used in quantifying the requested increase or decrease for those tables, and we're asking that they describe the, how the charge request affects the area of service, inpatient, outpatient, and gross revenues, NPR, and FDP, and explain the assumptions and methodology used in that allocation. And again, after that, after we've done every year, um, give us the dollar value of one percent of NPR, and that is also in that appendix table. So it's right there with everything else. Um, as it relates to charge and the impact of charge. Here in other operating and non-operating revenue, we're looking for them to please discuss the advances, relief funds, and other grants received. And that is, of course, in Appendix 7 of Part B that we've already reviewed. And the respective treatment of each funding source as of year end 2020 and projected year end 2021 and budget 2022. <clears throat> and this is all considering that we don't know what could come out of this next stimulus package that potentially could be approved today. So we wanted to make sure. 2022 was in there um, in the event that federal guidance changes on the current figures or that other revenues um, can be derived from the newest stimulus package coming out of Washington. But again, refining that and asking them to talk about how they've utilized those funds to shore up their hospitals in this time of need. <clears throat> Operating expenses, really the biggest, um, the biggest change here is the discussion around inflation and the relevance of those items on your budget and operations. Um, this is also a place where discussions on cost saving measures could occur <clears throat> and how you're um, combating against some of the inflationary items that you're seeing and, and overall how, how have you changed the way you've um, handled your operating expenses um, as the pandemic has continued on. <clears throat> operating margin and total margin, we've added a piece here following last year about um, asking hospitals if their budget request in fiscal year 2022 
will include support or a need to support any other entities outside of the physical hospital. Um, an example of this would be a higher operating margin to transfer the surplus to a subsidiary in support of that entity. And this really stems from a post Springfield world in which <clears throat> we feel the board should understand the request in front of them and how it might impact other entities if there's a direct relationship there. And it's not to say that the board doesn't approve of these transfers, it's just to have a better financial picture of what it is they're approving. So if there is a transfer that's going to occur, should the year play out the way the hospital is budgeting, we think the board should know what the impact of that is uh, overall, as far as transparency is concerned. <clears throat> Uh, down here in risks and opportunities, we've added a couple of sections that we'd like to hear, but we hope the hospitals won't limit it to what we have on here, um, because certainly this pandemic is um, providing uh, probably more than enough of each of those topics. So we'd like to hear, again, this goes back to the removal of the off-cycle or non-financial reporting. Please describe the impact of COVID on access and care wait times at your organization, including the use of telehealth, telemedicine. COVID-19 related safety protocols and other relevant factors. And that's really, we didn't think numbers on paper would do much um, as far as informing the board. So we think there's more value in getting to the heart of how has it impacted your organization? How have you taken measures to mitigate that impact or even improve um, wait times in your organization? We wouldn't necessarily derive any of that from some of the numbers on a spreadsheet. So let's get at some of the um, the more beneficial value-based points of what the hospitals are doing to recalibrate care um, during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we have more of a broader one here in number three. Um, discuss any lessons that you've learned in the pandemic thus far and any positive changes the hospitals adopted or plans to adopt in the future. Now, certainly the dust has not yet settled on what this pandemic means, but the folks at these hospitals are extremely intelligent people and they're certainly looking for um, what the world will be afterwards. And there's no better point of contact in that discussion than the folks who are working in that environment every day. So we feel that that certainly offers again, added value to the budget discussion to understand where the hospitals are going. <clears throat> Next, we'll move into part D, value-based care participation. Um, <clears throat> we are looking for, as we discussed already in the appendix, we're looking for, are you participating and in what programs? And of course, in the narrative here, we wanna hear more detail on that than just the, the appendices that we have to support that narrative. Um, we also wanna understand what you're projecting for dues and what your ma maximum risk liability by payer is gonna be. So please, um, discuss that with the board. And also we got a couple of other items here around value-based care <clears throat> um, where we'd like to know to support our other regulatory processes. Has the hospital, and if so, how has the hospital changed the way the hospital delivers care as a result of participating in value-based programs? Which value-based program funding sources were most instrumental in driving that change? Next, we have what factors support or inhibit hospital participation in more value-based payment programs? We know that there's going to be a renewal of the all-payer model coming up. So it's very important to understand um, what factors have supported or inhibited um, each hospital's enrollment in value-based programs to date. Um, that is a data gathering measure that will help better inform the future of value-based care in the state of Vermont. And then we have what barriers and opportunities are there to further delivery system reform in your community. And again, trying to inform the next iteration of that process in the state of Vermont. And then <clears throat> finally, last year we requested from the hospitals a risk reserve table. We didn't um, distribute that until the fall and we'd, we'd like to collect that again, but understanding it might not be pertinent to this process here, we still want to collect it. So we will be in touch with a date on that later, but it will most likely come um, later this year after hospital budget so that again, we can take that information and better inform our other regulatory processes.
coming down into Section E, capital investment cycle. <clears throat> we touched on this at a very high level last year, and we're statutorily obligated to discuss capital investment. But last year, we really scaled it back. <clears throat> and we heard from a lot of hospitals that a lot of those investments were put on hold, and rightly so, given the financial uncertainty. We're still hearing that to some extent. So that began to get our wheels grinding that this can only go on for so long. Eventually, investments are going to have to be made. And whether that's equipment replacement or building renovations or building construction, we want to start showing the board in this budget process how those plans may have changed on a hospital by hospital basis and what that ultimately means for the future of the budget process. Um, because as I said, they can only put off these projects for, for so long before they've got to start ramping them up again. And that's for the benefit of not just the organization, but the patients that they serve. So we really want to start you know, getting out ahead of that and getting a better understanding of, yes, they, are on, they, they may be on hold now, but what does it mean looking forward? <clears throat> so with that, those basically capture all of the items that we've put into this process this year. Um, again, in front of us here, we have presentation content with the caveat, as we did last year, this is an opportunity to discuss the effects of COVID that certainly trickles through everything these hospitals are doing. And the pre presentation content in front of you mirrors what we've talked about already um, in the narrative. And that's something that we made happen last year so that um, board members, when they're taking notes on narratives and they're hearing the presentation, aren't having to flip back and forth. So that's more of an internal technical item that we want to keep going because it seemed like it worked pretty well last year. <clears throat> so, Mr. Chair, that concludes the um, hospital budget guidance piece. Um, I'm going to turn it over to either Mike Barber or Ross McCracken to talk about the um, hospital enforcement, and I will project that on the screen for them right now. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, this is Russ McCracken. I'm a staff attorney with the board, and I'm going to take this one. Um, Bear with me, Russ. <laughs> no problem, Patrick. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing it. Uh, so what we have is a draft enforcement policy that was included with the materials. Um, wanted to uh, just what, just provide an overview here um, and highlight a slight difference in approach that we're uh, taking this year compared to um, other recent years. And great, there we go. So for this policy, our proposal, our suggestion is to create a standing um, a standing policy for hospital budget enforcement rather than uh, reviewing and adopting a new policy each year. Um, we think it, it takes away, you know, it uh, relieves the need for um, adopting a new policy each year and also improves the uh, consistency from year to year by having a standing policy. Um, my understanding is there's some precedent for doing this going back uh, a couple of years. Um, if, so, so Patrick, if you want to scroll down just a little bit. Um, this is based on prior uh, enforcement policies that the board has adopted um, with some slight changes to make it a standing uh, policy rather than specific to any um, to any fiscal year. Uh, but to, to highlight it um, specifically with regard to NPR and FPP, uh, it says that um, the amounts established by the board may be enforced and the board may review hospitals who have a variance of 1% um, or more above or below the approved NPR and FPP. Um, the board is not necessarily going to review all those hospitals and such a review would not necessarily lead to some kind of enforcement action uh, by the board. Um, other aspects of this I think are 
consistent with uh, prior enforcement policies, but uh, the budget review would include a comparison against results of the total hospital system. Um, the board can establish particular requirements uh, for reporting to, to facilitate that review, and hospitals certainly have an opportunity for a, a public hearing in connection with that, that review. Um, the enforcement actions here uh, track back to uh, GMCB Rule 3.0 on um, hospital budget uh, enforcement. And we call out a couple of the specific actions that the board may uh, the board may take in connection with enforcement. Um, one last point to make for consideration um, is that there is not currently an enforcement policy in place for FY21. Um, as this policy is drafted, it's a standing policy and it would take effect uh, when approved. And so therefore it would also apply to FY21. Uh, so it's a question for consideration to the board whether um, uh, the board would like to have this policy effective for FY21 um, or take some other course of action with respect to the, the FY21 budgets. Um, otherwise, once once um, if this is adopted, it will apply for FY22 and years going forward until it's modified or uh, rescinded. And that's all I had to say about uh, the enforcement policy. Thank you, Russ. Did you have any follow up comments, Patrick? I do not know. Um, we are in agreement with legal that a standing policy would be best moving forward and then the board can either choose to enforce that year or not, but the policy would still stand year over year. So the staff support that. So before I turn it over to the board members for comments and questions, and I'm gonna go in alphabetical order just to prepare you, but I wanted to um, point out a couple of things. Um, Patrick, you, you said that it um, the way you phrased it, um, someone might be able to interpret that it was a foregone conclusion that the model would be extended. I don't think that uh, anything is a foregone conclusion. What we know is that everybody will be rowing in the same boat to try to continue health care reform in the state of Vermont. And that for the most part, um, everybody wants to move away from fee for service to uh, value. But I don't want anybody to take it that there's um, anybody's come to a foregone conclusion that it will be an extension of what we have currently or similar to what we have currently. Um, the second point on um, the reporting on the value-based care, um, I think the language covers my concerns there, but um, the way you mentioned it, I just, I just want hospitals to go beyond just saying what they're doing um, with attributed lives for uh, one care. One thing that we do know is that even those lives that are attributed, there's not enough that's based on fixed perspective payments and still too much depends on fee-for-service um, restating. And, and so I'm hopeful that hospitals will be reporting some creative ideas that they're doing in their communities to um, move away from, the, from that volume and to value and you know talk about some things that they're doing differently than they did the previous year and, um, you know, in my mind, it doesn't necessarily have to be limited to attributed lives. It, it could be something as a community project that's done with other organizations in the community that tries to create a continuum of care um, that um, is different than um, the way we do things today. So I just wanted to uh, point that out. So with that, uh, I'm going to move to board member Holmes. Jessica. Great. Thank you. Um, so first of all, Patrick and team, thank you so much. Uh, this is really a lot of thoughtfulness put into this. I think it's streamlined a lot of the processes. I think there's a lot more clarity 
I like the changes in the document and in the uh, the tables, especially I like the change in charge table. I think being able to create an apples to apples comparison across hospitals is going to be really helpful this year where we had we haven't quite had that before. So understanding how the change in charge drops down to gross revenue, net revenue by payer, by service area, I think is going to be really helpful. But um, so I have. Uh, that's kind of an overview, just a thank you, and I think it's it does seem like an improvement. Um, I have a couple of thoughts around a, a couple of minor things um, and potentially one larger, but I actually, Kevin, if you don't mind, I'd like to hear from other board members first. <laughs> so I'm going to take my, I'm going to take a pass, and if you can circle back to me, because I want to hear what other people are thinking first as I still frame my thoughts. Okay, board member Lunge, Robin. Thanks. Um, I also overall uh, thought the changes in the guidance were good. I'm interested in hearing, um, you know, public comment and feedback on that as well, of course. Um, uh, on, in terms of the NPR FPP growth ceiling, it would be helpful for me to have um, some discussion um, around what makes sense given the volatility that we ex saw in 2020 actuals and and what we might expect or really have no idea for 2021. Um, just trying to think through, like in general in the past, I've liked the approach of, of sticking with the three and a half percent because while it's not a one-to-one -to, -one to the total cost of care, of course, it sort of keeps us in that all pair model total cost of care direction. Um, but given some of the uncertainties around utilization, um, I'm wondering if that still uh, makes sense. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. And again, as with Jess, I'm interested in hearing other thoughts on that. Um, and I, I have to think a little more about the enforcement stuff for fiscal year 21. So I will. Uh, do that while others are talking and over the course of the remainder of the week. Tom. Well, thank you. Uh, um, I, I think I'm going to wait for Jess to speak first. <laughs> no, it's just, just, just a joke. I know um, I'm going to. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, once well, there are some minor edit issues and clarification things I'll I'll send into Patrick just in an email um, that weren't significant. One small thing that may or may not be significant is that I noticed in all the vaccination clinic accounting, there was never um, a record asked of how many vaccinations were actually made, um, you know, at the clinic level. So I think that that would be helpful. Um, I know that having been recently vaccinated that um, they 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 keep meticulous records about about the, you know who's been vaccinated and, and the number, and uh, I just think that you know to be able to include that um, on the vaccination tallies uh, would would be a helpful context. The, the the major area that I wonder about um, is the FPP part of N NPR FPP, and I noticed uh, in the you know, we're we're in the fourth year of the all pair model, the third year of the ACO. Um, I noticed in the 2021 budget process relative to the 2020 budget process that basically the um, share of 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 NPR FPP that was FPP basically stalled at around uh, four, uh, 14 .4, 14 14.4, 14.5%. And that's 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 worrisome to me. Um, and uh, um, but the 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 highest um, uh, hospitals, uh, one of the highest hospitals with the South Southwestern Vermont Medical Center at twenty two point two percent. And then I, I kind of want to reference this uh, Vermont Digger article, you know, that that uh, was out recently that talked about, and I just read a couple of phrase quotes from it, but it talked about how they are addressing um, a kind of transformation uh, at that hospital. And so it's, so you have some quotes like, Southern Vermont Medical Center flipped from 80% inpatient and 20% to 
outpatient to 79% outpatient and 21% inpatient. That's a big move. Um, they they won award from this uh, Lown Institute organization uh, for um, how they've restructured their nursing corps into transitional care. Um, and here's a, another quote from the article: As the system moved from mostly inpatient to mostly outpatient, the fee for service healthcare model, in which hospitals and doctors are paid for the amount of care they deliver instead of the quality, began to deteriorate. And further, the state was looking at health reform for the future and payment reform. I think we all came to the conclusion that there has to be a better way to Thomas D. Um, and one final uh, just quote uh, among many uh, nurses at Southern Vermont Medical, Medical Center got together for a retreat, then began to outline how a transitional care model might look at the hospital as they began to provide free care at risk patients in the community unnecessary hospitals, hospitalizations at Southern Vermont Medical Center decreased by 55%. So my, my point is, is that, you know, you read this article, you think, you know, I, and I'm not assuming cause and effect here, uh, but even the uh, officials at the hospital are saying that as they migrated off of fee for service to fixed prospective payments, um, they were allowed more flexibility in how they uh, assigned their staff. Um, and some fairly apparently a uh, fairly uh, significant better outcomes for everybody um, um, have arrived. And so as I look at, at these budget guidance, I'm wondering whether or not we should ask each of the hospitals, what is your long view in terms of FPP? Um, uh, given that some have stalled um, in the 2021 budget process and looking forward, you know, what do hospitals think? Same question that we asked the ACO, by the way. You know, what is what is the uh, the amount at that hospital of FPP that will leverage the kind of reforms, you know, that, that we hope in, in the all-payer model? Um, is it um, 14%? I don't think so. Could it be 22%? Well, it looks like Southern Vermont Hospital is doing quite well in terms of making that transition. Um, so having a, a, an outlook of not just kind of current metrics relative to reform, but a two or three year look forward, um, I think will help, help us understand where each hospital wants to go relative to healthcare reform. And it will help us in terms of our rate review process to try to in integrate into the rate review the, uh, the ability to have the insurers and the payers um, better aligned with the providers uh, so that the FPP amount can can be in, increased. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say, I, I say this because, you know, we're in a maturing environment. The all pair model, we're in the fourth year. The ACO, we're in the third year. Um, and uh, um, it looks like we have at least one hospital that is doing tremendous stuff consistent with the model. Um, but um, if, if if the reform movement kind of begins to stall as maybe the the budget the 2021 budget over 2020 might have uh uh indicated with the, the amount of fpp staying basically flat um you know uh, we we might need to be in a position to encourage the transition a little bit more disciplined as opposed to just asking hospitals you know to report to us about where, where they're at so that's my only major, major comment. Um, but uh, I, the, the contrast between that, that Digger article, and I suggest everyone read it, the contrast between that Digger article and the progress of reform there versus on the grander scale that the FP, uh, levels of FPP are basically flatlined uh, 2021 over 2020 uh, was striking to me. And uh, um, I, uh, you know, I, I think it's an area that, is, is needs encouraging rather than just reporting. Thank you, Tom. Maureen. Uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> first, just a couple comments, um, and, and thank you for doing all the hard work on putting together all the materials um, on some of the materials. And, and one is when we talk about the risk and opportunities 
and we asked for them to talk about the positive changes that they may, may be doing because of COVID. I would take positive out and just say changes, right? Because there, there could be changes that they're enacting that um, we, we hope they're, po you know, we're positive, but, but it may, may not always end in a positive result. There may be things that are coming in. So I would just take that out. And then, you know, also on the, the, the table that was in appendix that dealt with all of the funding that was received, um, I think there's a couple changes um, on that on that table that could be helpful. One is I'm I'm not sure if we had a line in for the PPP program uh, separately, and I know maybe not a lot of hospitals got that, but um, you know clearly that would be a line we would want in there. And the other thing I think on this chart is um, the amounts received putting it in by year that it was received because, you know, it's good to know, did we get it in, you know, did a hospital get it in 20? Did they get it in 21? Did they get it in 22? Um, and then there might need to be totals on the chart at, at some point to, to kind of reconcile how much money was received in total over the years and how much has been recognized as revenue and how much is recorded as a liability or you know, still kind of hanging out there. Um, Maureen, I don't can you know. just pause for a second? Um, sure. Patrick, we're getting a little feedback occasionally, and it looks like yours is the one lighting up. Could you just uh, mute, mute your volume while Maureen is you speaking? Yes, Thank I you. have my windows open. I apologize. No problem. <laughs> and, and another area for this, I don't know if we have it here or in the, in the, um, in the basic part of the report, but just commentary on, you know, on the, what they received, are they going to have to pay it back, or, or you know, how, how did it flow through um, for the impact? Because thankfully, it looks like several of the hospitals, it, it really helped get them at least on a balance sheet and, and um, you know, bottom line operating margin close to what their budget was, even though their top line certainly was a miss. Um, and I guess now if you can go to the, the discussion page uh, that we have, because ultimately we have to make some some decisions, right? And, and it may be helpful to, to look uh, on that discussion page. And I have another, another one I'd like to throw out for the board to talk about potentially as a discussion. And I think everyone knows we can't talk about this privately, so I'm going to throw out... Um, when you know typically we we focus primarily on the npr and you know we're looking here at a ceiling and there's so much uncertainty on what's been going on um you know who, who knows what the right number is going to be off of the you know off of their budget because it's it may depend on how much they have to catch up next year right so so it may be similar to what happened last year where we thought people would be coming back into the hospitals. So, so maybe it's going to be three and a half. Maybe it, maybe it needs to be higher. I don't know. Um, but I'd like to throw out looking at a change in charge and potentially putting some guidance around change in charge as a concept. And certainly this won't be without controversy if we, if we do that. But, but the reason I want to, you know, I'm throwing that out there is, is a couple things. You know, when we, we, when we don't put in a change in charge and, and a hospital comes in and we had a hospital with a very high double digit number uh, commercial rate request and they were falling within the, the guidance of the top line, it, it was almost like, well, we can ask for a 20% increase because we're below a three and a half. And so, you know, I, I think maybe putting some parameters on, on change in charge as something that we're going to look at because that's been brought up several times. So it's a question, do we do that or not? And, and the other part of this is last year we had put in this concept of, of bifurcating the rate and putting in a kind of temp, what we thought would possibly be a temporary rate. And when we sent out all of the final, the final um, for all the hospitals for, we, we didn't put that in. We, we, you know, it was clearly in there that we said for many of the hospitals that got a 6% rate, we had said it would be 4% base and a 2% COVID. 
And we were very concerned about putting something out as a temporary COVID with the threat that maybe they wouldn't be able to get government funding. And so that, that was, for me, I think last year, the driver of why we, we said, let's not put that in there as a separate rate. Um, but we did talk about considering that, or I know I publicly stated we, we would, I would consider that in the next year's review. So we did have, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six, about eight, eight of the hospitals got a temporary COVID um, adjustment ranging from one to three percent, um, and six of the hospitals did not. And so, you know, one, one way to look at this potentially would be over, over a two-year two-year rate, right? So you, so one way to potentially do this, and again, just throwing this out there for board members for discussion, is, you know, if on average the hospitals got, and I'll make up kind of a number, it's not on average, but three and a half percent was the base rate, three and a half to four percent last year. And then if, if this year we were to say, again, just throwing out a number, seven percent, you know, combined for the two years, um, that would take into consideration those hospitals that got an extra last year. And if we think about that extra, what we thought was going to help accommodate the, the, some of the issues that were occurring because of COVID, we didn't know how much additional funding hospitals would get. We don't didn't know what their financial condition would be. But we said, you know, in theory that the rate they got for, for the current fiscal year we're in was, was maybe inflated and that we would adjust for that, um, that would go away. Um, we didn't do that in the orders clearly, but, but one way to accommodate for that would be to expect that those hospitals that have that, and it's carrying forward for the orders for the current year we're in, may get a smaller rate the next year. So if somebody got, many of the hospitals got 6% rates, and we originally intended it was gonna be 4%, base and 2% COVID. So in this example, if we said seven, then the expectation would be they'd only come in with a relatively small rate increase, one, um, if, if we said seven. So just trying to throw out a concept. Also, just going back to what we said last year, originally in the orders, um, we talked about, you know, due to the pandemic, the hospital may request, and <clears throat> the board may consider two types of changes in charge one request to reflect standard price growth and a second time limited charge to offset fiscal year 20 commercial revenue losses due to COVID-19. The hospital should justify its COVID-19 related charge requesting the factors and the time limited COVID related charge request may be reviewed and adjusted based on fiscal year 21 year to date revenue and utilization data. And that last sentence is really important because um, when we when we do these, we kind of make it a blanket. You know, all hospitals get the same thing, and all hospitals are the same. And that's because we don't try to regulate to each individual hospital. However, the reason I'm stating this is because we do look individually at each hospital when they come in. And so this, you know, when we review what actually happened in 21 and their their revenue utilization, and I would also put. Um, operating margins and profitability, it, it may impact whether we would impose something like this. And so, you know, for example, if a hospital um, received tremendous support um, from other sources, that chart seven we just looked at on the appendix, and that they're in good shape, right? That, that they actually, they, they didn't get their NPR, but their bottom line, their balance sheet is in good shape, and they may continue to get funds in this current year, that may impact the fact if they got a COVID rate increase last year or what or a higher rate. You know, I guess we can't really say it was COVID, but if they got a rate, you know, above three and a half, four percent, then maybe we would consider in in the guidance this year um, looking at that and making some adjustment for that. So don't have it all worked out. Just wanted to throw that out there. I know, you know, that in order for anything, if for us to vote on anything like that, obviously, you know, three of the five of us would have to even want to consider that. So 
um, you know, I'd like to put it at least on a discussion point for consideration. And um, as people go through, I know we're going to go back to Jess at some point, and, and we haven't heard from Kevin. Don't know what your response is to that. And you know, so so that that's um, that's really all I have to add to this. And you know, should we decide to go down that route at all? Then we could kind of work out some specifics of of how it would work and what that concept was mean. I, I was just trying to look into how do we consider what we did last year, what the intent of what we did last year, and some hospitals benefited, others didn't. Now we know a lot more about, um, you know, again, funding and the financial health of hospitals. And that will play a role both negatively or positively. So I just, before everybody <laughs> comes back at me, you know, hospitals that are in poor financial condition, you know, we, we may not be able to do that as well as other hospitals. But um, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Maureen. All, all very valid points. And uh, I get the uh, 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 perception that Jess wants to back clean up. So I'll make a few observations, but uh, um, <laughs> hold back the ability to uh, say more. But um, I just want to say that um, as far as the discussion points that have been enumerated by the uh, team, um, I'm okay with the caveat that um, I want to hear from the hospitals if there's a problem, um, and I want to hear from the public if they view a problem, but I'm okay with the due dates and I'm okay with all the tables um, unless somebody points out a problem that um, makes it uh, harder on the hospitals uh, to uh, meet those, those uh, tables and uh, the due date. Um, like Maureen, um, I really have focused in on, on two areas and that's the uh, NPR FPP growth ceiling and the uh, charge request. And as I said, after we debrief from last year's budget process, I really think that we need to be clear on what our expectations is. Otherwise, people um, submit their budgets and they are in compliance with the guidance. And I, I feel uh, um, almost a moral responsibility at that point to them um, so I just want to uh, um, be very clear that I feel that change of charge is just as important as NPR FPP. Um, and on that token, um, one of the problems that I've had this year looking at 22 is that um, NPR FPP will be looked at compared to budget. And we all know that a number of hospitals are significantly below the budget. So, um, you know, Maureen brought up a, a two-year look. I don't know if, if that's the right thing or if uh, somebody has a different idea, but I do know that uh, um, I don't want people creating aspirational budgets. And the reason why I say that, and again, this is all anecdotal, but the stories that I hear from providers and consumers around the state is that there almost seems to be a charge to do as much as possibly can be done to try to keep the, the cash register going. Um, and this is kind of blunt speak, but and uh, it's not really fair to the hospitals because if I was in their situation, I understand there would be pressures to uh, bring in the revenue. So, um, but I do want to point out that, um, you know, we're trying to um, get the right utilization and you know the right care at the right time in the right place, and I do think that um, it could be a return to aspirational budgets, um, looking at uh, the revenue um, to the budget. So that's a major concern for me. And also, I think that we have to be very specific on what the ceiling is that we're putting forward. Now, again, even the revenue is a ceiling; it's it's not a target. So there's nothing that would require people to come in um, at that level. And we saw last year several hospitals came in significantly lower because they had more accurately um, forecasted what they thought their revenue was going to be um, for this year. Um, and, and keep in mind, that's not a dig at anyone either because this is like throwing uh, darts at a wall. Um, when your world completely changes from day to day, 
whether it's the onset of the pandemic or when we'll be coming out of it, when people feel safe to go back, all these type of things. Um, do some of the changes uh, result in, in permanent changes? Like, <laughs> has this pandemic resulted in the right people using the emergency room versus the overutilization that uh, most studies pointed to pre-pandemic? Um, we just don't have all the answers. So I think that um, just as we do in revenue, we should be setting a gross ceiling in the, the uh, charge request. And I think that's um, really important um, because otherwise, um, given some of the uh, large increases that were given last year, I think that um, we may be setting a base moving forward that is going to jumpstart whenever there is some normalcy, um, a growth in, in healthcare costs in the state of Vermont. And it has been our goal right along to try to keep the growth of healthcare costs um, it more in line with the, the growth of the overall economy. So um, I'll probably have uh, more to say after uh, hearing from Jess, but those, those are my points. Jess. Yeah, no, I just really wanted to listen to everybody because I do think this is such a challenging year. Um, I thought it was because it's spring training and you just wanted to back clean up. No, I really, <laughs> you know, no, I really wanted to hear where others were thinking about these things. I've given some thought to it, but uh, obviously more thought has to be given to it. Um, one quick note, I like Maureen's edits to the stimulus funding table. So Patrick, you get a second vote on that. Um, that's really helpful. Thank you, Maureen. Um, you know, I think everybody's comments were really interesting and helpful. It's so one thing I'll just add about some of Tom's comments about Southwest. I'll just add that I've been reading a lot more about um, this movement to hospital at home. And so I'll just say as a, as a, a note on the side, CMS has actually just created an acute hospital at home waiver or pilot program that's allowing for reimbursement uh, in the home for a lot of patients that otherwise would be in the hospital. And I think it's a really interesting model. And I hope that hospitals in our state are looking at that because I do think that it has uh, many implications for in terms of staffing, you know, reducing staffing stresses for reducing the cost of remote monitoring and also potentially could be improving quality because less infectious, you know, in hospital-based infections. So it's a really interesting model. A lot of folks are suggesting that's what's going to be happening, that a lot more uh, you know, care is going to be delivered in remote settings because technology is now allowing remote monitoring to take place. But anyway, that's an aside. So it was interesting to hear Tom's comments about that. Um, I share uh, some of the uh, Robin's concerns around how do we set an NPR, and I'm interested in that conversation, particularly in this, you know, in this huge world of uncertainty that we're living in. I can only imagine that building a budget during these times is a significant challenge for our hospitals, and I completely appreciate that. I wondered if, um, you know, on the one hand, I could I could see us doing a 3.5 just out of the consistency with the all payer model, and then you know allowing hospitals to to uh, respond as they're seeing the needs changing over the next few months, but using that as as a ceiling. I could also potentially see us maybe taking the fiscal year 19 actuals, kind of the pre-COVID actuals and rolling forward what would have been 3.5 over the subsequent years and sort of looking at a cumulative, you know, look um, at what uh, what NPR could potentially be that would accommodate the low revenue during the COVID, you know, peaks, but also compensate for higher revenue to manage pent up demand. So somehow looking at it that way. Um, I'm interested in the conversation around change in charge. I, I I hear Kevin's concern about and others and Maureen's concern about maybe the having some guidelines might be helpful um, to the degree that if you know if somebody meets the the NPR target but then their charge increase is in the double digits, you know that's something that we would look at and we're, we have looked at and we have reduced and so having some guidelines around change in charge might be helpful. Um, I would say to Maureen's point, if we do review the, the time limited charges from last year, the COVID kind of uh, charge that we put on, it'll be really, really important to look at the fiscal year results 
Um, Because I think many of the hospitals, it turned out, needed that rate, needed that extra rate. So I'd be reluctant to just claw that back if it turns out that their financial situation, they didn't get the stimulus money that they, you know, anticipated or even with the stimulus money, their their, um, bottom lines were harmed. So I think we do have to look at that. Um, In, you know, one of the things I was thinking about was... Um, you know, in light of the pandemic and the stresses that, you know, we're hearing from all the hospitals in terms of trying to deliver care during this, you know, pandemic and trying to deal with vaccinations during a, you know, the crisis that we're in, we could, once we figure out what the, the thresholds might be, we could propose that hospitals that submit budgets to the Green Mountain Care Board, let's just say, you know, with an NPR growth of under 3.5%, and let's say a change in charge under 3%, for example, would not be required to have a hearing in August. So if they were under the NPR target of, and I'm putting this as a placeholder in 3.5 and under a change in charge of less than 3%, if they met those two thresholds, um, we could say, you know, you don't need to come in for a hearing. You have to, the, the hospitals would have to, you know, submit their budgets um, all the reporting requirements would have to be, you know, met, including the narrative. Um, I think the budget assumptions in there would have to be deemed reasonable in line with prior year's budgets, so nothing out of the ordinary. The hospital's uh, cash position would probably have to be strong for us to want to do that. And the hospital could, shouldn't be undergoing any kind of big significant restructurings or reorganizations, and they'd have to, you know, ask for that waiver. But I'm thinking, you know, that could reduce some of the administrative burden or at least the, you know, having to come in for a formal hearing if they were below maybe those two um, levels. If I don't know, I'm just throwing that out there. Um, I like the standing enforcement policy um, that's been put in there. And I, I guess I would suggest that we would waive that for 21, just given all the uncertainties. It's hard to imagine how hospitals could necessarily have necessarily have met a budget that was made under such uncertain circumstances. Um, and this is just a, another, this is a, such a minor piece, but I'm going to throw it out there. Um, last year during the budget process, thinking about quality, we heard from a couple of hospitals, at least one or two, I think, about the benefits of participating in NISQIP as a quality assessment tool for, for surgical, you know, um, the surgical aspects of their business. Um, not many are using it right now because I understand it's a bit costly. Um, that's what we heard. I guess there, apparently there used to be funding for it. The funding was taken back and a lot of hospitals dropped it because it was costly. But my understanding is it does provide value in improving surgical quality. And so one of the things I was thinking we could do to encourage more hospitals to use it was allow an NPR allowance you know, maybe that goes above whatever we decide for an NPR to cover those additional costs of participating in NISQIP and perhaps Voss could negotiate some kind of volume discount across all the hospitals. But I think it sounds like it's a valuable instrument to improve surgical quality and the hospitals that participate see great value in it. And if we can encourage that through our budget process, I'd like to see that. So those are some of the thoughts. But honestly, I'm really interested in hearing from the hospitals. I'm interested in hearing from other stakeholders. I'm interested in hearing from, again, from more board members as we start to unpack this. I'd love to hear from the hospital budget team where they might see uh, a growth ceiling, ceiling set and what are some of the ways that we can set it in response to all the uncertainty that we're in. So those are my thoughts. Thanks, Jess, and uh, um, it's good to hear your thoughts. I, I'll give you some quick feedback on uh, some of what I heard. Um, I, al- I always want to make sure that we use the, the term um, ceilings, even though they're not true ceilings, because we know that um, this board has been willing to uh, blow through the ceiling to give uh, higher um, requests in the past to uh, make sure that um, it works for a given institution. Um, but if we were to give people a pass on the hearings, maybe there should be a little bit uh, more of an incentive to say something like um, a hearing would be waived if you come in um, below these requests. And I, I don't know what the right amount below it is, but um, if you came in at least a half percent below um, 
on one or the other or a combination that would equal that between the two or something like that, just to add a, a little bit more incentive. Um, that would be something that I think is worth exploring. I don't know what the reaction might be from hospitals, if it's even worth it to them to um, not have the hearing, but I'd like to hear that from them. I think it's an interesting concept. So um, I applaud you for thinking outside of the box there. Um, did other board members wish to say anything before I open it up to the public? Um, yeah, I have a couple things um, to, to comment on after um, Jess's com comments. And I think on the, um, I, I think maybe for the discussion points for consideration, you know, Patrick, maybe adding the couple things we've talked about. So, so possibly putting in a change in charge um, guidance, as well as this um, topic on, on hearing, you know, whether, whether we would waive hearing or not. Um, I might be able to get there. My, my, uh, my initial reaction would be I'm okay with setting up some guideposts and, and saying that a hospital is, is approved. Um, I still wouldn't mind hearing from them, knowing their company, you know, maybe talking about their risk and opportunities or just giving them a, a you know, a, a discussion. Maybe it's a lot shorter, you know, instead of being a three or four hour window, maybe it's a, you know, an hour and a half, you know, a shorter window and, and we're limited to questions, but really just to get, you know, to have that conversation because there's so few times that we actually have the hospitals in and, and we, we just get to talk about what's going on, how, how's the business, what's, you know, what's your, how are your finances? So even someone that might meet a um, rate request, because many of our hospitals, even last year, you know, they didn't ask for exorbitant rate requests and we had several hospitals we approved as submitted. When you go through the orders, there were, I think, five or six hospitals that were approved as submitted. So, so we do do that. So everyone knows, you know, we we, we do, and um, you know, but but having them at least come in and and even giving them, you know, a forum to be able to talk about what what's going on with with COVID, what, what money they received, what their risk and opportunities are, what they're worried about. So I would I would throw out a hybrid maybe potential um, if we didn't just wave completely but um you know maybe it's a real skinny down you're you're approved so so that you know we can't rescind that type thing you know if we if you meet these guideposts whatever you know would be what kevin threw out what just threw out you're approved but you know we still would like you to um meet with us and i i think right now it's still scheduled to be a zoom so it's a, that that would prevent or we'd at least if if we are back in person by then at least those could be zooms you know like we would allow that to be a zoom meeting and and just come in. So I would, I would put that in. Um, for enforcement, um, I guess I would like to, you know, circle back on when do we have to make that decision. And, you know, enforcement is plus or minus. So, you know, I was the lone vote last year that said, I don't think we should give it up. But it wasn't because we were going to come down on the hospitals and be enforcing, you know, you have to cut your rates and do this and that. I mean, again, it's a time to talk about what happened in the year. You know, we just we get this from the consolidation that that the staff does which is very helpful and from the written commentary that the hospitals do but you know there's a missing element of of talking to to people who are working there and you know kind of being able to to talk to them about what's going on so i you know again the the enforcement is plus or minus as we saw and and you know from for the most part it's been on the minus right we have maybe not often, but I think we have, you know, brought in hospitals to give them an incremental, you know, commercial rate or, or something to help them when they've been struggling. So, yeah, for me, enforcement, I, I don't think we need to make that decision now, but I would defer to legal to find out when we, when we need to do that. Um, and, you know, maybe it's not under enforcement, but I, I do think we need some more forms of just being able to talk to to the hospitals we we do regulate and w when was the last time we all met with them <laughs> it's been a while so but thank you for those comments jess and ads thank you maureen I, other members of the board actually kevin can i just ask a quick question about um it occurred to me you know we have this other process ongoing with the sustainability planning and um i'm just wondering what other board members think about the role of the sustainability planning effort in the budget guidance if there is a role 
certainly the sustainability planning was part of the uh, budget orders from last year. So I'm just, you know, I realized how should we think about that in, in this budget guidance? Is it a separate um, process altogether? The expectation will hopefully be that they'll participate in the sustainability planning as a result of the budget order from, you know, this year that we're in. Uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. And I would just say a quick reaction to that is that um, if everything um, works out as everybody hopes, I think there's a possibility for that. But, you know, if all Americans aren't truly given the opportunity to have the vaccines by the beginning of the summer, it, it may require a little bit more of a push off. But I don't think we're in a position today to make that decision, but that's just my view. Other members of the board? Yeah, I had um, some reactions and a, a question. Um, I So I definitely am interested in hearing feedback on uh, the change in charge guidance, because that was something to Maureen and Jess's points um, that we discussed quite a bit in last year's both guidance and hearings. Um, and I do think, I'll just speak for myself, I would have been less comfortable with some of my votes on the amounts um, if I had thought that those were built into the base for time memorial. Um, so I, I do think it would be good to be able to take that into consideration this year. With that said, we are in, still in the middle of a pandemic. And so it may be that that gets kicked, the can gets kicked down the road for another year there, because I do think, um, you know, depending to Kevin's point, depending on how the vaccine rolls, rollout goes and whether there are, you know, whether and when boosters are required and all that kind of stuff, it's just hard to know what normal will be and when normal will come back. So um, I think for me, the, I want to be able to have some flexibility there, both in terms to consider it, but also to then maybe not consider it if if we still feel like the, the situation warrants it. Um, and I, I did kind of like your idea, Jess, about looking at, and I think Maureen actually had suggested this in previous budget guidance, looking at like 19 actuals and kind of rolling the NPR forward so that we're not really tied into the COVID weirdness, right? So trying to really look for a longer term um, trajectory, uh, given the uncertainty and all the challenges uh, in the last, last year and this year. Um, so those were my comments. Um, I did have a question um, for Tom. Tom, I'm wondering if you had a more a, a more specific idea about what you were thinking in terms of leveraging the FPP. Um, to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if FPP is fairly static this year given the COVID situation because FPP is going to change when more people are attributed and that depends on more primary care joining the ACO and given the operational challenges around COVID I can't imagine that uh, providers, providers are, are really focused really on any not. sort of operational change other than COVID since that's been really a consistent operational change for the last year. Um, so I, I'm intrigued by the idea. I'm just not sure if this is the year, uh, given the COVID situation. But I, but I did want to say if you had something that you wanted to build into the guidance, um, I think I would just want to know a little more specificity about what you're thinking. And I do think you'd have to build it into the guidance if you wanted to use it in your decision making on the budgets. Well, I mean, that's a very fair question, and I don't, you know, I haven't, uh, I don't have any silver bullet here. My my thinking on it was that, um, you know, we've always had this two canoe kind of uh, concept of one foot in FFP and one in fee for service, and uh, breaking out of that, I think, is a little difficult for hospitals. I can understand that. Uh, fee for service is something folks are very comfortable with, and it's uh 
it's something um, allegedly that they have some ability to manage to, but you know through the number of procedures that are ordered. Um, and the other hand, you look at uh, at least you know, and I haven't validated it myself, but I look at what seems to be happening down at uh, Southern Vermont, and they seem to have uh, you know found or found a path to. Uh, put more of one foot into FF, F, FPP and lessen the load on, on fee for service. And uh, so, um, you know, my concern is that 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 with COVID, um, the comfort level with with fee for service that that healthcare reform gets scoped, gets uh, kind of stale and stalled. And uh, so, um, if there is a window in the budget process. To ask hospitals, okay, here's where you were in 2020 budget. Here's where you said you'd be in 2021, which system wide is basically level funded. Walk us out three years um, and 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 give us a a, a profile of what is your thinking um, about where where you'll be in three years relative to reform. And it might be that um, you know, we find the hospitals, you know, really haven't thought that through. Um, they're just kind of making it up as they go along. Um, other hospitals maybe have really thought it through and and, are, and have a plan. Um, you know, I, as a board member voting on uh, in, in, in rate review, you know, where board members have some influence on encouraging insurers to participate in, uh, in uh, fixed prospective payments. Um, it's a marriage between the provider and 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 the payer. Um, so if there's a window there, I you know I I I, I, I would support it because I, I I'm I'm worried that we're stalled. You know, on, on a very practical level, that the momentum of fee for service um, is is uh, is strong, and um, you know some have kind of breaking breaking the constraints of it, but others you know, may. Uh, may, may not be. So I'd, I'd just like to know where hospitals think they are going and where they will be um, three or four years down the road in the same way that, that Southern Vermont looked at this three or four years ago, and we find them now in a position where um, their inpatient uh, uh, procedures are down and they are um, a, a, a much more um, reform-based, so to speak, of, of provider. Other board members. Yeah, I, I would just like to add my thoughts. I I um, <clears throat> I agree with. I got a a phone behind me, kind of uh, with an answering machine answering. If that's what you hear. Um, but I, I I agree with Maureen that um, the what we did last year in terms of hospitals and the kind of COVID kicker. Is something that shouldn't be taken for granted. Um, it was intended to be um, a one-time event, um, and then it became complicated, and we built it in, into the rate. But I don't, I don't feel that that that, that those COVID rates were were embedded. They may be needed now. Circumstances may be changed now, and you know we have to deal with the reality that's out there in the street. But um, I, I think it's fair to say that our process. You know, should find some way of of looking under the covers and seeing whether or not that's needed. Um, that might be following a kind of suggestion that Jess had is that we 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 take a look uh, at um, hospitals off a of 19 uh, 2019 base or a 2020 base and roll that forward um, and not include the COVID to say, okay, well that's the backdrop, that's the baseline. You know, now show us that. Uh, that 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 COVID funding is is truly needed, um, but it's uh, that gets complicated too. I, I I think about the fact that you know we had a 2.7 percent NPR increase last year, which was very good, but that was comprised of uh, 13 hospitals coming in cumulatively at four tenths of one percent, and one hospital coming in um, at five percent, and so th there's an imbalance there and. It would take some creative thinking as as to how to set up guardrails to um, uh, you know to to kind of unwind that complication. I mean, basically, if we can simplify the process, in my mind, 
to three areas, affordability, solvency, and reform, and uh, have a de minimis uh, approach in terms of a burden on hospitals, you know, that's the path I'd like to get down. Thank you, Tom. Other board members? Yeah, I forgot to comment on the <clears throat> hearing issue. Um, I I definitely want to make sure as you know, given the current situation that we are uh, being sensitive to the realities on the ground around COVID and the vaccine distribution. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely open to the idea of waiving the hearing, although to Maureen's point, I I would miss hearing from the hospitals, I have to be honest, because I do think the the qualitative part of the discussion is really helpful um, for me, at least, in terms of really understanding more the milieu and just the qualitative nature of what's going on with them. Um, so I would miss that. So that's what, and I think it does provide a valuable context above just the dollars and cents um, to understand where things are with reform, where they are with telemedicine, you know, really what's happening in the field, which I think makes our decision making ability better to have that understanding. So that's just to say I haven't decided, um, but, you know, I'd love again to hear uh, from hospitals and the public uh, about their thoughts um, before we vote. Okay, anyone else from the board? Okay, hearing none, the first hand that was raised was Dale Hackett. Um, Dale. Good afternoon. That was a lot. You, you oh, covered, lot. you, you, you uh, I'm live. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, that. That's what happens when you're at home and, and people don't know who you're talking to. And it, 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 um, anyways. Um, we need humor in our life too. Yes, we do, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. First, you covered a lot. I can't comment on everything. Obviously, there I had thoughts going through my head every time you switch topics. I was covering a topic, and I, I just I can't I can't record all my own thoughts as you're. It's really complicated. Uh, but one, when it comes to reporting on. The vaccination. I would like to see a reporting on households vaccinated, if everybody was vaccinated, minorities vaccinated. I think this is important for the Green Mountain Care Board to see and for the hospitals to record and share. Um, I, I've got examples within my own family that I have uh, family members that are minorities. That entire family. One person went to school, got the variant of the COVID, and within four days, the whole household had it. Um, and they tested positive and they tested positive for the variant. The idea that schools are safe, not really true. Depends who you are. Um, so I'd like to see them do some reporting with the vaccines that also includes minorities and our households vaccinated. Um, the other one would be ch the charge master versus the, that was great, by the way, how you presented that, the inflation model. Due to fee for service and double digit charge master, it becomes pretty obvious that you're charging to balance your budget. That's not a sustainable model. It may work, but it's not a sustainable model. Consumers really don't like seeing things like that. I think there is a connection there that I'm trying to make as to this gets at some of the things consumers really complain about as far as cost and health care. FYI, by the way, I was just listening to Senate education or House education. When it comes to Medicare, uh, Costs in healthcare, their budgets, school budgets, are really being, they're taking a nosedive in terms of the cost of healthcare 
versus how it's taken away what can be invested in children. Um, well, the, pub, the, one more, the public budget process, you were talking about streamlining it. I would just remind you that making it quick might not be a good idea in one respect. It's also supposed to be transparent to the public. Um, and I don't know more about that. That's the end of my comments. Thanks, Dale. I just wanted to uh, shoot back at you on the uh, school budgets that um, I agree with you that um, it's a huge cost driver to with the taxpayers. But I also want to point out that um, the people running um, the health insurance program for the teachers have purposely not tried to move away from fee for service um, and uh, more towards uh, value-based care and it's reflective of the actual um, costs that are incurred by teachers in the state of Vermont in that schools should really be focusing more on what they can do to keep their personnel healthier and away from the most expensive care but that's my uh, soapbox for the afternoon um, I saw two hands go up at the same time because, Mike, you work for Jeff, I'm going to let Jeff go first unless he wants to defer to you. Jeff Tiemann. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I will go first. Um, I, I just want to start. Oh, oh. OK. Um, I wasn't sure if I was muted or not on screen. Um, so thanks for your support. And, and I appreciate the Green Mountain Care Board's willingness to, to examine and kind of discuss a budget process that makes sense, given all the changes and the amazingly unusual year we've we've had. I, I have to agree with Dale. A lot of stuff surfaced today, um, some promising ideas and some problematic ones. Um, and I think we'll need some time to process some of the thoughts shared. And glad that there's a uh, an opportunity to do that. Um, we do understand that you've worked hard to understand the situation hospitals are in, um, the uniqueness of COVID. Um, and, and I really do hope this is the only time ever that we have an extended conversation about how a pandemic affects regulation. But we do have to have that conversation. And hospitals, as you know, have been an amazingly big part of Vermont's success managing the pandemic as well as, if not better than, most states around the country. Um, and given that and how busy and preoccupied it made us, in our most recent letter to the board, we had asked for a complete suspension of the budget process, or at least a very limited version, um, which was authorized by last year's emergency legislation. And as I said in the letter, this wasn't to dodge responsibility or avert accountability, um, but to focus on the core work of caring for patients during such a difficult time. So if that request is not under serious consideration, we do appreciate the guidance being slimmed down. Um, and we wanna make sure that it collects only the critical information that is needed and that the process itself is minimally disruptive given everything hospitals are still doing, which I enumerated in detail in that letter. And of course, all the unknowns we're still managing from clinical circumstances to financial um, conditions that are still very much, much changing. So I, I think we're gonna get back to you with some specific comments and ideas on simplifying the process, which I know that conversation is already taking place. Um, one that I did wanna comment on just briefly here in the conversation today is the hearings. Um, I, I am somewhat compelled by Jessica's idea of possibly being able to opt out of the hearings if a hospital meets certain thresholds. Um, but I will say, as some of the other board members expressed, that many hospitals like to tell their stories, believe it or not, as much as you like to hear them. I think where it becomes problematic sometimes is in the follow-up and sort of protracted Q&A um, or more requests for information that become uh, burdensome and difficult to, to manage. Um, and then the last thing I would say um, is that I, I do agree <clears throat> with board members who said we should extend the no enforcement provision for, for FY21. I think it's just obvious that this year will be as unusual and unpredictable as the last one um, and should be subject to the same standard. As always, thanks for the time, Kevin. Thank you, Jeff. Mike. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, just to echo Jeff's comments, um, thanks to the board for their hard work here. Uh, Patrick, your team and I have uh, been meeting quite frequently. Thanks for your time. Um, everything you presented, I think, should stand as presented. Um, I do question the um, additional 
uh, value of some some of the disc added discussion um, and, and would suggest respectfully suggest how do those new information points change your decision making or even improve some of the information you have I suspect that um, it, many of it is nice to know and, and really won't change um, the decision making process for 2022 um, as far as um, the 10 one rate increases go um, the industry. That's how they look at that. You, we call it change in charge in the regulatory space um, to limit or put parameters on those. Um, you already sort of adjust as as necessary and, and take into consideration net revenue and rate increase at the same time to put parameters would would and could jeopardize those organizations with unfavorable payer mix even further because um, they need higher rate 10 one charge increases than other organizations with more favorable payer mix. So I think the way you do it and the handles that you have on it today allow you and 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 hist history says you do make those changes as you uh, evaluate budget. So um, I think that would be a problematic um, uh, move. Um, as far as fiscal year 2020 um, and your look at 2020 and how it relates to uh, 2021 and moving forward to 2022, we have to remember we took in $190 million of CARES Act funds. That's 75% of, of the total amount that was not loan based. We have a system with $3 million of margin. Six of our hospitals are um, in the red. So the notion that we have a healthy organizations is really hard for me to hear. Um, we we have an organizations that have limited net revenue growth over the past years from upwards of eight and a half percent to below four percent, and our operating expenses have tracked right along with those. And it's by no mistake that operating expenses and operating revenues or net patient revenue and FPP align very closely. Our organizations, as you know, rely on non-operating revenue um, to, to fund their budgets. And it's it's this notion of healthy and we can cut our way out of these things that is very problematic to hear as uh, part of the industry. Um, I think uh, the board and their deliberation should uh, uh, take some of this into account. And um, really, I, I thank you um, all of this is said with complete respect and your and your uh, appreciation for what's going on in the industry within this pandemic. And uh, so thanks. And um, and my plan uh, from these materials is to get them out to CFOs, have them look at some of these appendixes, get some feedback to Patrick. I don't think there'll be um, very significant changes or or discussions that would uh, be problematic, but but Patrick will be in touch to uh, work through those. So thanks again, and I appreciate the time. And as much as you can do that in an expeditious manner, will be greatly appreciated, Mike. You bet. I'll um, I'll get it out today, uh, uh, Chair Mullen, and and seek feedback uh, for by by the first part of the week. Thank uh, you, Kevin. This is Sam. Can I have a Can I have a a hand up. Um, you can. Uh, Mark Stanislaus had his hand up first, but I'll put you in the queue right after him. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> He's shorter than I am. <laughs> okay. Well, that's an intro. Uh, thank you, Kevin. So, Mark Stanislaus from the University of University of Vermont Health Network. So, you know, I mean, very much appreciate the open conversation. And I, like Mike, think the staff did a very good job. At, you know, walking us through this, as I also think the board did a good job at sharing their opinion. So, you know, um, I do have to say that there's a lot to digest here. Well, so we're going to take this all in and provide constructive feedback, or, you know, we hope it to be constructive feedback. But there are two high level points that I would just kind of like to share. And, and, you know, this isn't a question, this is just more of an understanding. And it goes back to what Mike said. I think there needs to be more focus on what a sustainable margin is. This meeting is following up a review of historical performance through FY20. And if you just look at that trend line from a total hospital system, that's not sustainable. There's a lot of items that go into that candidly, and there's a lot of variables, but I think we need to have more conversation on what a sustainable 
hospital system is. And that needs to be balanced with affordability and there's components of rate and utilization that all need to be balanced. But, you know, I really worry about that. I really worry about that trend line and we need to find a way to pull that more into this conversation, understanding that there's many items to balance. So that was one point. And then the second point that I wanted to share is, you know, as we think of changing charges or maybe it's commercial rates or, or you know, how it rates, as we talk about guardrails, I think we need to have conversation about what drives those guardrails. I don't think it's as simple as saying three and a half percent. I I think I, I would throw out a slight concept to think about is, you know, what commercial rate lift is necessary to cover inflation? I mean, and that's going to be different be to, based upon what the different hospital types are because they're paid differently. That's going to be a lower number for critical access hospitals because there's less of a cost shift. That doesn't mean there's no cost shift, by the way. And, you know, how the cost shift comes into that. So, you know, I like the idea of, of isolating out the inflation column, but, you know, there should be a direct correlation of the impact on the commercial rates. And that's how we should think about it more because I think it's difficult to just say, here's our guardrails without putting those assumptions in place that helps us identify what those guardrails are. But those are very, very high level thoughts. And like I said, you know, we're going to take our time and we're going to think about this and we're going to respond in a very timely manner um, um, in all aspects of this. So, you know, thank you very much for the opportunity for this conversation. And we look forward to working with you on, you know, how we think about, um, you know, continuing or establishing a sustainable hospital system through 2022 um, and beyond. Thanks, Kevin, Mark. I we did hear from your uh, legal um, team, and my understanding is that you will have your comments to us by Friday. Yes, we're going to do our best to do that, Kevin. So, I, I, I mean, um, if it's not Friday, it'll be Monday morning, first thing. But, um, you know, we're going to try to make it work on Friday. We'd appreciate it if you could. Thank you. Okay. And Jess, were you saying something? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to that last point by Mark. I mean, I wonder if, if one thing to better understand the change in charge requests would be for us as part of the process to ask the hospitals to back out, um, you know, to basically do uh, an analysis of their change in charge requests. What proportion is due to inflation, right? The straight up inflation. What proportion or what is the amount that's due to cost shift? And what amount is due to trying to get a margin, right? I mean, that's effectively, I would imagine the three components of a change in charge. Some of it's just flat out medical inflation and other inflation, right? Part of it's, hey, because the public payers aren't paying their fair share, we've got to cover some of that through our commercial charge. And then some of it's, hey, we need a margin. So if, if maybe there's a, uh, a question in the guidance that asks hospitals to back that out, I think that would be really helpful going forward. I think understanding those three component parts of a change in charge would be really helpful to all of us. So maybe, you know, building on that base, I'm not sure, Patrick, if there's a way to um, add that or think about that in the guidance. I agree, Jessica. And I think there's two other possible items that could impact that is um, uh, any significant changes in payer mix um, and 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 also um, any significant changes in bad debt and charity. But that's where we think the conversation should focus more is really what the components are that are driving it. And then, you know, where we can figure out how that balances against affordability and, you know, you know, continue that conversation together. But that's really where we think it should be focused is what are the components that are driving? And they are slightly different by hospital too. So that's why I think it's hard to put guardrails. And when I say hospital, they're different by hospital type. Um, um, so anyways, but you know, we would welcome the opportunity to have that conversation in more detail with the board. Just to give you a heads up, Mark, as we uh, try to start fleshing out language on um, change in charge, I still have the goal of having one set definition of what comes forward. And I know that we've given you guys a pass in the past about doing it differently than the other hospitals, but I do think that there has to be uniformity and um, that discussion still has to take place. So, Ham? 
Uh, thanks, Kevin. <clears throat> I've got s- several points. I'll make them as tight as I can. Um, I, I'm, I'm writing my book now on health care reform. Um, you'll probably hate that. but the You've been um, doing that I'm, for 10 years. Um, I know. <laughs> well, it's, it's a lot has happened, and, that's, and it's still happening. <laughs> Um, and one of the piece of it is I'm gonna, one of the pieces I'm going to use today is your comment about the fact that this that we're not we're, not, we're completely stalled in getting um, in getting increases in actual risk contracts, and I think that's right. I think the, uh, the the whole reform in Vermont is dead in the water, and the huge question is whether it's dead completely. Let me just say why. Well, number one, uh, on your comment about the hospitals need to look at this. The reality is that the question of whether you're going to have a risk contract is not up to the hospitals completely. They have to agree, okay? But the main decision has to be made by the payers. And what we have now is neither neither Medicare nor Blue Cross has, a, has any interest in anything but a shadow fee-for-service contract that gets reconciled six months later. So the whole incentive of, 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 uh, of a fixed contract is gone. Okay, so the question really is the, the question really that the people that have really have to change is mainly Medicare, okay, but also Blue Cross. Uh, secondly, my second point is this: the uh, reality is I think that the your, your, your two big your two academic medical centers, tertiary care, uh, level one trauma centers, and all of that is the U- UVM and Dartmouth. Dartmouth has no real interest in taking risk. They're very reluctant, and I and I don't be surprised. Nobody should be shocked if Dartmouth completely drops out of this system. If they do that, if they completely drop out of reform, then there's no real reform structure on the whole East Coast, and that includes Bennington, because Bennington's main tie to a tertiary center, well, part of it's Albany Med, uh, but mainly to Dartmouth. Thirdly, the the reason why FIFA service is so powerful and so hard to uproot is that fee-for-service makes way more money and if you want it so if you say well what is uvm going to do well uvm is in its sixth losing quarter and that's two of those is before covid okay and there and the the uh, and so the question is can either D, dh assumes that it can't afford to do this uvm is in a position where i don't know where they're going to get the money uh, let me just, my fourth point is, there's a huge issue here about what is happening nationally, okay? There's a council of 25 of the biggest players in the United States, the council that acts as an advisory body to the American Hospital Association, okay? Um, it includes all the big feet. It's got Mayo Clinic, it's got UW Seattle, it's got Johns Hopkins, it's got Yale New Haven, it's got you name it. They've got, it's got them all. None of those people, not one of those players wants any part of the kind of risk contracts that we're talking about in Vermont. None. Now, they understand that so, so the issue of whether they change, they don't expect it and they don't really want it. But what they're looking for now is the question of what Joe Biden does. The only way to resuscitate the real momentum behind behind reform of the type that Vermont has led on, okay, is if Biden decides to do that. Most people don't expect, most of the big feet players don't expect him to, but if they do, then it can come back, okay? But the reality is, the, 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 the reality is that it, when you, the, you make so much more money at fee-for-service that you're just running upstream. And so, so it's very interesting to see here. We Neither neither Dartmouth nor UVM is any longer in a position to to really move lead in this direction. They have to back up, and there's nothing we no we don't even know what money is going into DH. It may be it is, I think it's up to at least four to five hundred million dollars a year. But in any event, we simply don't know. And Dartmouth Hitchcock wants no part of anything that gets them tangled up with the Green Mountain Care Board in Vermont. If you think they do. You're just wrong. The uh, the finally is um, I'm not sure what uh, the, the the problem at UVM. Okay, UV you may want to look at UVM as as the same as a 25 bed critical access hospital. 
but they're not. That's like the dip. That's like refereeing a, the difference between refereeing a sumo wrestling match and a badminton <laughs> game. the The reality is the reality is that you that the that the, um, the decisions by the board have drained more money out of the out of the UVM system because of not being able to get any uh, uh, pr- approval for any of the cost shift. Okay. Um, then, the, then the then the hospital is now publicly underwater for. Okay, so my, my that's those are just my comments. I just don't. Uh, we're dead in the water. Okay, the thing that kind of all the kind of detailed messing around that you're talking about with these budgets is not going to reignite reform. Not going to happen. Thank you. Well, Ham, now that you left us with the uh, thoughts of uh, sumo wrestlers playing badminton. Um, we'll go to anyone else with public comment. And I see that Dale has his hand up again, Dale. Yeah, this is slightly different, but, um, the model that was mentioned that Southwestern has, uh, Jessica commented on it. And I think you commented on it between the two of you that the feds also are embracing this type of model. Um, if that shows a lot of promise, just a suggestion that in one of the Green Mountain Care Board meetings soon, that be presented with more detail so that everybody understands what that model is going forward. That's my comment. If we could only have the days where we could have traveling board meetings, we'd be down in uh, Bennington having that conversation, Dale. But one of the things that the, the board has been reluctant to do is put any ass on hospitals as they're dealing with all these other things. And and so um, if, if Tom D. wanted to come forward and volunteer that he has the time and the ability to do that, then we certainly would be receptive to that. But we're kind of reluctant to... Uh, put further demands on their time right now. Totally understand that. Thank you. Other public comment? Well, board and team, I think uh, it's clear that we have a lot of decision uh, points that we have to uh, start to uh, flesh out that we um, really need the feedback from the hospitals as soon as possible. And that, um, you know, there are areas of agreement and areas um, of uncertainty moving forward. But I think and hope that next week we can start to slowly um, make some decisions and um, we'll leave it at that. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, please thank your uh, team members for all the work that you've put into this guidance. Um, Very helpful. And is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Maureen has moved to adjourn, seconded by Jess. Um, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Um, I can tell you that it's sunny and 50 degrees here in Rutland. Hopefully you're all uh, sharing that same weather in your areas. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.